people were paying 40, 50, 60 grand a year to go to some of these colleges. Now they're watching their classes on Zoom, in their pajamas, in their bedroom, paying 60 grand a year to do that. And then they go onto YouTube and they can learn something similar from maybe a better teacher. YouTube is really decentralizing the way we learn to make education more accessible for anyone. And you can learn anything you want from people who actually love what they do because you cannot make it on YouTube if your goal is to get rich. I joke that Indian people make a dollar to spend 20 cents. American people make a dollar to spend $2 wow. next to credit cards and lines of credit. You know, it was crazy. Obviously the pandemic was crazy. No one knew what was going on. It was a scary time, but man, there was a lot of waste in the government. A lot of abuse happened. And some of the things that we saw the Federal Reserve Bank do, I mean, it just shows you who our system and our society really cares for. My real life tuition is, are the scams and the crap that I went through, the failures that I had to go through, because that's how you learn. Yeah. You learn what not to do. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor. So my guest today is a face many of you already know. Minority mindset is in the house. Mr. Jaspreet Singh, as many of you may not know, is a former attorney too as well. Got scammed by a marketing company, but an investor and entrepreneur didn't receive any formal financial education. And he's on a mission to make financial education fun and accessible. Jaspreet, welcome to the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel, brother. Oh man, thank you for having me. Thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to be here with you. I'm excited to have you. A lot of my colleagues, we, have, we nationally have an insurance agency, and a lot of my guys either reshare or share on their own social media your posts. Oh, man. And uh, even with insider trainings, they bring up your, your content, so I appreciate you for that. I appreciate that. That really means a lot. You know, we work hard here every single day to help provide that type of financial education, so that really means a lot. Thank you. So, brother, let's 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 talk about this, my man. Um uh, I'm, I'm just curious, who was, who was Jaspreet in high school? Because, you know, you we were, you know, Filipinos have some of the same similar thought process by the family. You go to school, get good grades. You have to be a doctor. You got to yeah. be an attorney. You got to be that. So <laughs> who, who was Jaspreet in, in high school? Oh, you, you kind of hit it right on the head. It, <laughs> I had uh, kind of two personalities through college. I had the personality that my family knew, and then I had the personality that uh, my friends knew. So I was always working hard in school. I always was told that if I wanted to become successful, I could either become a doctor or I could be a failure, but nothing in the middle. So I studied hard in school because I figured that I need to become a doctor because my parents came to this country with next to nothing. Uh, my dad came to this country with less than a hundred dollars. They bust their butt. So they wanted me to become successful. Yeah. And I was always told that the way I become successful was by becoming a doctor. Yeah. So that's what I knew. And that's what I was working towards. But in the back of my mind, I was always an entrepreneur. I always had this entrepreneurial bug. I didn't know what the word entrepreneurship was. English yeah. was my second language. I didn't know that you can make a living doing something without a degree. So I didn't know that that was possible, but I always had that entrepreneurial bug. So, you know, in my parents' eyes, I was studying very hard. They didn't like me doing anything that wasn't academic. I played football in high school. So did. they what did position? not like that. Uh, I started off as a cornerback. I hated that. Then I became an outside linebacker. And I love that because okay. now I'm not chasing after the receiver. I'm coming in and blitzing the quarterback. So I loved <laughs> outside linebacker. Um, but I was studying hard in school, playing football. And then I was trying to make money. Right. And I worked in weddings. Yep. And I also worked at Auntie Anne's Pretzels. So when I, I love, by way, the way, what is it about Auntie Anne's pretzels, man? I mean, is it marketing where you walk into an airport, you walk into a mall, as soon as you walk in the door, you smell it right away. Like, I got to come get this. That's, that's why it's successful. And But when you work there for a couple of years, you get tired of that smell. <laughs> I haven't had it since I worked there. <laughs> <laughs> but by the but, way, for everybody that's honest, my, my favorite is the, uh, the, the, uh, the almond crust, almond crust pretzel. Oh, yeah with caramel, the caramel dip. So I'm know, pretty sure fact. I can still make that if I needed to just roll it <laughs> out and flip it. But you know, I was, I was working, I was working um, at these weddings and I got to meet a lot of DJs. And then we had the idea, my junior in high school to start hosting teen parties for kids in our high school. So here I am, this kid that's working hard trying to become a doctor. And now I was working at weddings and I'm hosting teen parties and I'm making a little bit of money. The first event was a flop. But then I started making a little bit of money. And now I'm like, ooh, I got some money. There so you go. now I need, I need to go and uh, look. Oh, this is all in high school. 
that's in high school, man. I mean, it's not wow. a ton of money, but I started, I uh, had a Toyota and I was uh, upgrading my car. I put on new rims on my car. I put some tents on my car. I put some, just, just upgraded. You know, I wanted to look rich. Gotcha. And that's when I started learning about money. Was, uh, so your parents, your parents never bought you a car. You bought your car. Well, my parents helped me buy my first car. It, was, it wasn't a, you know, a great car. We're talking about like a, a, an old Toyota Solara, but gotcha. this, is, this is when I was in high school. And then when I go to college, I thought everybody goes to college to study, to, you know, they spend the Friday nights in the chemistry lab because I didn't know anybody who went to college in America like that. I didn't know what college was supposed to be like. I didn't yeah. have any guidance. Yeah. So I go to college and I brought five things. I brought like my microwave. I brought a sleeping bag. I brought a few other things. I didn't have a towel. I didn't have um, a, like a blanket. I slept in a sleeping bag for like a, a big portion because I didn't know what I needed. Yeah, yeah. College, and I'm assuming that everybody's supposed to be studying. Yeah. And I see everybody partying. <laughs> they don't want their money. I'm like, none of you all have any money. Yeah, you are blowing it. Your student loans at these parties. So now my minority mindset starts to kick in. I was like, well, instead of me going to all these parties, how about I start hosting the parties that the majority? Ah, go to? there you go. So I started knocking at the doors of these clubs and bars as a freshman. I don't drink. Yeah. I don't party. But I started going to the clubs, asking if I can help host their parties. Yeah. And some of them said, yeah, $10,000. I don't got $10,000. But then some of them said, sure, don't pay us anything. Just give us half of the revenue that you collect at the door, the cover charge. Smart. Uh, okay. So now all of a sudden I'm in business, freshman in college. And, that, and that's where I really started to get into entrepreneurship. But my parents didn't know about this entrepreneurial like, side of me because they wouldn't approve. So I had to do it all in secret because I loved entrepreneurship. I liked it. I don't know that I can make a career out of it, but I enjoyed it. And that's when I started learning about money. But then on the other side, I was also busting my butt in school. That way I could become a doctor one day, which yeah. never happened. So, so okay, let, let's, let's uh, rewind a little bit. So I, I'm, I'm visualizing this. So you're from, you're from Detroit, right? Yep, yep. What, you, went to, you went to high school in Detroit? I'm in the metro Detroit area, yeah. Not the city of Detroit, but the suburbs. Gotcha, okay. So... Um, and I'm thinking, are you the oldest of uh, siblings? I'm the oldest have... of two. So you're the first one going through all this stuff. Yep, yep. Okay. I have no idea what's going on. And so, and so you're going through all this stuff. Now, was the demographic of where you grew up, is it a lot of uh, uh, people from Punjab or was it people They're all that's... white. Okay. I was, in, and I was going to, like, especially when I was younger in school, I was like one of like a handful of non-white kids in my school. Okay. So, so I was picked on and bullied a lot. Punched, spit on, Got it. called a lot of things. A lot of, ra a lot of racial undertones, oh, and overtones. I went through, uh, you know, 9-11 happened when I was uh, in oh, crazy. junk, right? So after 9-11, now all of a sudden, you know, people started hating people who wore turbans, even though they might not understand what a Sikh is, my Sikh. religion. Right. Um, and so, you know, people started calling me names. I didn't understand what was going on. Wow. I was a little kid. And, you know, it got physical a lot of times too. You know, people would throw my books on the ground. They would throw me to the ground. I got, you know, went through a lot of stuff. It, it was, yeah. it was a tough time. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, uh, 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 just you know, you, you, what you may not know is, you know, the, the seven fair squad YouTube channel, a lot of it has to do with not only becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire, but also a, a lot of our YouTube subscribers also come from a faith based perspective too, as well. And we're not trying to shove any faith uh, down people's throat we want to introduce things. So therefore people can understand how faith and finance, uh, work together and it's up to them to find their journey of who they want to call god or who they want to call savior personally for me it's 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 jesus but i know you're you're a sikh and can you explain to us the sikh faith and maybe with inside that faith how money was talked about in that faith sure so there's a difference i guess on the religious side and the cultural side in our culture um, the northwest indian culture we call it our state is punjab where our family's from money is taboo you don't talk about money <laughs> um, and then in that culture it's a save heavy culture I joke that Indian people make a dollar to spend 20 cents. American people make a dollar to spend $2 wow. thanks to credit cards and lines of credit. So it's the same healthy culture traditionally. Religiously, the Sikh religion, you can define it in three tenets. We call it Nam Japo, Van Shako, and Kirat Karo, which means remember God, serve others before you serve yourself, and earn an honest living. That is what the religion boils down to. Uh, so remember God, it's, it's a sign of humility. Remember where you come from. Remember yeah. that name. Serve others before you serve yourself. The concept of serving and giving is a, is a major, major component in our religion. 
uh, we have a concept called seva, which means selfless service. It is the fundamental duty of a Sikh to serve others. And then finally, earn an honest living. What that means is it is illegal religiously. You're not supposed to accept a free handout. Wow. You are not, you are supposed to earn every dollar that you earn, every dollar that you have, honestly. And so uh, like, if you go to India, you'll see uh, beggars and slums, but you will not see a sick beg for money because in our religion, money must be earned through honest work. Wow. So it is very important uh, the way that you earn money that it is earned honestly. So Jesper, how do you feel about unemployment checks? How do you feel about you know the president saying, hey, we're gonna give you free healthcare and free, you know, uh, uh, there, there, there's a 5.9% increase in social security this year, even though the consumer price index is at 5.4, so it's really a half percent increase in overall social security. Uh, how do you feel about section eight? How do you feel about food stamps? How, how does, how do you, through your lens, how does so, that come to you? From me as a person who practices a Sikh religion, it is our duty to give, to help, but not to ask. So, you know, when you talk about unemployment checks and this and that, I look at it more from an ec unemployment uh, or an economic perspective. It hurts the economy in the long run. Yes, some people need it. Some people need that extra assistance. Some people in a certain position can use the government assistance, but I don't like it when it gets abused. And I think we saw a lot of that happening where people who took advantage of the unemployment system, I know some people who sure. were a part of that, who said, why should I go apply for a job when I can get this extra free money from the government and continue playing Fortnite or Call of Duty in my basement? You know, it, 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 it's, uh, it hurts the economy in the long run when you have that type of abuse. It's hard to see when you have some people who are frontline workers busting their butt, earning minimum wage, who are now making less money than somebody sitting at home playing video games. Economically, that doesn't make sense to me. And when you look at my own personal finances, you know, Minority Mindset as a company, when the economy shut down, the government started giving free money to businesses. Businesses. Yeah. PPP. PPP, yep. And so essentially a forgivable loan. You borrow money that you don't have to pay back and it's free money to uh, businesses. So my accountant told me, hey, go take this money. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of, of dollars. Course. Lots yeah. of money for free. Yeah. Yeah. All I have to do is not fire anybody and use that money in our business, which... You know, yeah. when, when the business uh, economy shut down, guess what? We're still paying rent. I paid, we never uh, slowed down. We, we started working harder. And so, you know, we, we saw a fluctuation where in the beginning, ad revenue went down, people were watching more YouTube. It, it was confusing because now a lot of businesses stopped spending money, but people were watching more YouTube. It took a while for it to kind of even out. So we didn't know what was going on, but I kept paying our rent. I kept paying every single person, a part of our team. But I rejected that PPP money. Good for you. I know where it was coming from. Yep. I had no reason not to take it, right? The government was giving it to me for free. My accountant told me to took it. My friends told me I was dumb for not taking it. But for me, morally, yep. I feel right. Because I don't like the idea of taking money from the government when one, I don't need it. And second, I know where that money is coming from. Because that money, everyone says, oh, it's the government's money. Where do you think the government is getting their money? Hello? It's coming from you <laughs> and me, taxpayers. And yes. if you're not paying taxes, then you're paying it through inflation. Yeah. So I didn't take that money. And, and it goes partially to my beliefs because business, you know, from a business financial perspective, it's free money. Sure. Who says no to free money? We're talking tens of thousands of dollars Yeah. that I paid out of my pocket. But no, yep. I didn't take it. Yeah, it's funny because my, my banker, uh, we, we bank here and they said, uh, hey, uh, you would qualify for a thirty thousand dollar, thirty thousand dollar. Could you use another thirty thousand dollar, you know, flush of cash to your business? You don't have to pay it back, etc. And we're like, who who couldn't use thirty thousand dollars? That's a job. I yeah. can create another job. But at the same time, too, the principle uh, morally, why do I need to take it? And I'm just, I'm, it's not like I'm. Add, I felt like I was adding to the problem if I took it. Exactly. You. I mean, and, and that's exactly it. Businesses who don't need the money were taking it, which. You know, it, I get it from the business perspective because the government is saying, hey, take this free money. And so for most people, it's like, why wouldn't you? Yeah. From an economic perspective, it's, well, when you take that dollar, well, now more inflation is happening. More inflation is happening. The average person gets poorer each and every day. And for me, somebody who's trying to spread this type of financial education, who's trying to help people be better with their money, help people build wealth, 
It didn't make sense from a business perspective on that end and from my moral perspective. It, I mean, it, the, what happened in 2020 and 2021, you know, it was crazy. Obviously, the pandemic was crazy. No one knew what was going on. It was a scary time. But man, there was a lot of waste in the government. A lot of abuse happened. And some of the things that we saw the Federal Reserve Bank do, I mean, it just shows you who our system and our society really cares for. Is it the regular person or is it the institutions? Of course. Big banks, the people that are really the backbone of our economy, right? <laughs> and, and to see just the amounts of bailouts and quantitative easing. I mean, we saw unlimited quantitative easing and they say, oh, it's the government paying for it. But nobody understands that when the government pays for something, it's you paying for it. And even if it's not coming from your tax dollars, there's a reason why your grocery bill is more expensive. There's a reason why it costs more money to go on a flight. Inflation is a real thing. And if you're not paying it from your taxes, then you're paying it through inflation. And if you don't, under if you don't think that you're paying it, you're the one paying the price. That's right. When, when you're thinking about, you know, the, the, you know, the free money that's out there, the free education, free advice, it, it rocks my brain because when I was coming up in business, I've been in business now for 22 years, I had no YouTube. I mean, I would, <laughs> I would love to have a minority mindset in my brain at 18, 19, 20 yeah. years old. You know? I know. I, know. It, and it, I, I agree. Like when, when I was getting started, I, I hated reading. English yeah. was my second language. I, didn't, I, I never read. I almost failed my English middle school class. Um, and so... I didn't realize that books were a way for you to access somebody else's mind. And that's what I started doing when I was, you know, leaving high school. I luckily came across Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is the first financial book that I read. And I started learning more about money. But it's much harder to read a book and learn than it is for watching the 15-minute yeah. video on YouTube. Are you kidding me? I mean, and, and I, I love it, it, it because people are starting to realize what education really means because in the pandemic people were paying 40, 50, 60 grand a year to go to some of these colleges, which is fine. And then they started going to school from home. Right. Now they're watching their classes on zoom in their pajamas, in their bedroom, paying 60 grand a year to do that. And then they go onto YouTube and they can learn something similar from yeah. maybe a better teacher yeah. from somebody who is actually doing what they teach. And so YouTube is really, decentralizing the way we learn to make yeah. education more accessible for anyone. And you can learn anything you want from people who actually love what they do because you cannot make it on YouTube if your goal is to get rich. If your goal <laughs> is to get rich and you try to start a YouTube channel, you're going to go nowhere. <laughs> so you, you, you uh, finally did get your, your law license. Did you, did, you, did you pass the bar and did you start practicing? I did pass the bar. Um, I went to law school because when my parents found out that I wasn't going to be a doctor, they were <laughs> devastated. And so they were like, at the very least, you got to at least become an attorney to maintain that pride, right? Family pride. Right? Yeah. So I said, all right, cool. You know, I'll, I, I love my parents. You know, I know the sacrifice that they went through. So it was like it was a hard balance for me. So I said, okay, the advantage with law school is I know that law education can be used somewhere else. And I could go to law school part time, which means I could do my business full time. And so that's kind of what I did. Um, I went to law school part-time. I did my business full-time. Uh, I didn't sleep much. I was working around the clock, seven days a week. And uh, towards the end of my law school career, I knew that I wasn't going to be an attorney. So I didn't really do much of the traditional law school people stuff. Throughout my law school career, I didn't do that because I knew I didn't want to be an attorney. But then I graduated law school. I took the bar exam. I passed. I became an attorney. And I never worked a day as an attorney. Gotcha. I continued just building my businesses. Gotcha. And, and uh, uh, in your bio, you learned about getting scammed if somebody scammed you out of money. So if, if, if somebody's watching this right now, how would you guys, is there a checklist? Are there steps? Is there a formula? Is there a code to make sure that if you're going to bring in somebody into business, I'm going to help you in business, how to not get scammed? You know, I don't think you have a checklist. It's something that you have to go through as an entrepreneur. Really? I, no I, I, ha I have a, a saying, you know, there's kind of a running joke with my friends that anytime I start a new venture, I have to get scammed. When I started my event planning business, my first party, my first real party, it was a flop because we were planning this big party at a club for months, spent you know a whole bunch of time on marketing and promotions. The day before the party or the day of the party, like 2 a.m. the night before, the club got shut down mm -hmm. by the cops. So now the day of, I had to scramble to find a new venue. It was a big headache. 
lost a lot of money that day through a new party, but it was a, it was a, it was a mess. You know, even when I was working on a, a sock company and I got scammed by a fake marketing company, they had the money back guarantee that promised me this and that. I was naive, what, but what I also was skeptical. They, they, were they going to put it on TV? Were they going to put it on ads? What no, they, they said that we we're going to be able to help blow up your sales, your initial okay. sales. They were like, you know, if you give like $3,000 to us, we'll get you six, $5,000 in sales or 10000 I don't remember what they said, but it was a, a lot of sales. And they were like, don't worry, we can... We can't guarantee it, but we can essentially guarantee it. We promise you at least get your money back. Like that's a for sure. And I was like, okay. And they're like, you know, and if you're not 100% satisfied, we'll give you your money back. Little did I know it was a scam and they ran away. Uh, I, I started this company. I was, this is, I was younger. I was in like college at the time, started doing this e-commerce. Uh, Amazon was starting to become more popular. So I started buying stuff from China to sell it on Amazon. We were working with a quote unquote authorized retailer of some products. We were selling it, making good money. And then the real brand reached out to us and said they were selling counterfeit products and they're going to sue us for $7 million. What? Yeah. And so now we called the authentic retailer. I said, what's going on here? They stopped responding. Oh, no. Well, I was like probably 20 years old. So I, you know, I had a, $7 million is a lot of money. So I, I, we shut everything down really quick, ran away. And that was the last we heard of it. But you know, it's, it's these are things <laughs> that you have to go through, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a grind. How do you avoid it? Well, you can try to be a little skeptical. You can try to, you know, wet out, vet out who you talk to fine, but the risks are there. And you just got to understand that it's a part of the process. I, you know, I, I invest in real estate. I talked about my worst real estate deal ever. The only deal that I ever lost money on. I mean, it was a, the biggest headache that I had to ever deal with in real estate. It was something, it's a hurdle. It's your tuition. It's your real life tuition. Now, I paid a lot of money for my education, but my real life tuition is, are the scams and the crap that I went through, the failures that I had to go through, because that's how you learn. Yeah. You learn what not to do. It's interesting to say that because yes, college, you can get your education, but real life when real life hits, that's when you start learning, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Jasper, you know, t tell me about tell me about um, you know uh, um, how somebody can pick out the scammers online because there's so many people that that have are, that are guru types. And yeah. I'll, I'll just share with you a couple of mine because you know there's so many people that uh, I'm sure you see them going on your comments on your YouTube channel, mm -hmm. scamming people to this, scamming people to that, yeah. links to this, link that we we get that all the time on IG, we get that all the time on our on our YouTube channel. Very, very annoying and fake profiles. They pretend they're you. Yeah, that's the worst one. They pretend that they're you, uh, uh, because I've, I've had a couple too where they say, "Hey, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to market your brand. I'm going to get you likes and comments and this and this and that. I'm going to blow up your, your followers." And I ask them a couple questions. I say, "You know what? Who have you done? Who else have you done this for? Nobody. So you're experimenting on me. Yeah. So why should I? If you're experimenting on me, why should I pay you?" Mm -hmm. You need to get a proof of concept before you start charging me because there's gurus out there to say you can become a marketing agency and you can help business and brands, great customers alike. So, so how, you know, when you, when you size up somebody, I'm yeah. sure you sized me up before you decided to do this uh, uh, interview, because I know we, are, we have brands coming together. How do you, how do you size somebody up before you say yes to any type of business relationship or connection for, with them? The first thing is if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, and, and that really goes across all aspects of life. It's a very easy rule of thumb to remember. Just there's a lot of scams out there, people promising the world and will give you nothing. You see that all the time in the class business. You know, I spend a lot of money on online classes, but there's a whole bunch of crap classes out there. There's yeah. some great classes out there that are worth every penny. And there's also some crap classes. How do you know? Well, you learn by buying a bunch of crap classes and some good ones and realizing <laughs> what's good and what's not. But, but you got to learn, see who you're learning from, see yes. what they've done. And it, it isn't too hard to figure it out. And if you're struggling to figure out what somebody's done, then chances are they haven't done it. And so you want to see what they've done, who they are, and is this somebody that you want to learn from or do business from? And you can figure that out with a few Google searches. And if it's hidden, you can't figure out who this person worked with, what this person has done, then they probably haven't done anything. So one time, one time our, our guys were very enamored by a speaker, right? We had, we had, and, uh, and they were sharing their videos all the time. And I just asked, hey, so how does this guy make his money? Does he, does he make his money talking about the topic or does he make money doing the topic and then talking about it? Right. For me, I like, like yourself, you are an attorney, you're an, an investor, you're an entrepreneur. You've been through the hard knocks. You're just not a social media channel. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and, and that that's a, a big thing where, you know, yeah, people that talk about real estate investing, but they'll never walk you through one of their deals because they've never <laughs> done it before. You know, and, and I talk about real estate investing all the time. I'll walk you through some of my deals on our channel. You know, it's just a matter of exactly. You want to see what they've done. And especially if there's some sort of personality, they will walk you through what they do. They'll show you what they do, or you can just see their business success. I mean, just, just look at what their business has done. And, and it's very easy to see that you can, I mean, yeah, I know sometimes we can get kind of lured one way or another by the whole idea of, oh my God, I, if I work with this person, I, I will make so much money X, Y, Z. That makes it hard. We can sometimes get blinded by our own greed, but that's where it's important to take a step back, take a breath and put the emotion out of the equation and really understand what it is that you're investing into. Help me define what you have as your YouTube channel, minority mindset. Because there's a lot of minorities out there. Yeah. Right? Minority so, mindset so. has nothing to do with the way you look, your ethnicity, or your skin color. It's the mindset of thinking differently than the majority of people. Now, I started minority mindset as a hobby. I got scammed, uh, one of the scams that I was talking about. And so I started uh, putting out content just to help somebody not get screwed over the same way I was. When I started, you know, I started with an Instagram page The people said, start a blog. I was like, I can't write. So I'm not starting a blog, but I'll start a YouTube channel. So I started making videos and it was just for fun because I was doing so many other things at the time. And we started to grow. And I didn't even know that you could turn on monetization on your YouTube channel. One of my friends was like, hey, man, let me see how your YouTube's doing. I was like, okay, cool. He's like, how much money are you making? I was like, I'm not making any money. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, aren't you making money from ads? I was like, no. So he showed, looks at my channel. He's like, you know, you could turn on your monetization. I said, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I didn't even know that the, I was just doing it because I, I really cared about it. Then I got Does to sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exactly what happened to us. <laughs> so so yeah. it started growing. And then all of a sudden, you know, the YouTube channel is growing. I'm working on this other, and my, I was working on a stock company and I was like, wait, you know, like I can build a real business out of this type of financial education and providing this financial education. This is interesting because yeah, we're not making that much money here, but I love it. I love what I'm doing and I'm so passionate about it where I'm not so passionate about socks. So that's when I started making the transition over. We grew as a YouTube channel, but then I reinvested that back into the company. And now we became a full financial education and media company where we have a full team. We, you know, we, we have our minority mindset YouTube channel. We have the minority mindset news channel. It's a new channel that just came out. We publish daily finance and business news updates. You have the minority mindset and Espanol channel. You can watch our content in Spanish. What? Yeah. You Brand go, Jazz Preet, man. I'm so proud of you, man. Brand new. And then we got, you know, our blog. We publish content all the time on our blog. We have our daily newsletter. We have our newsletter team that publishes the finance, the finance, the business news every single day. You get this email in the morning that breaks it all down. So we really evolved from just a YouTube channel into a full financial education and media company. And I never expected that. But now like this is like my business that I'm working to grow because this is how I could spread my message. And I never thought that that could become a business. Love it. So the, um, I think in... Because the majority's broke, because it was the base minority. Majority's broke, so the minority's thinking differently than everybody else. So if I'm, if if I'm watching this and I'm uh, wanting to make a lot of money, and my family says this, my faith says this, my religion says this, my friends say this, and they're dragging me down, right? Because I see so many people get their dreams killed by the people closest to them, and the worst ones is when they say God is telling them not to be wealthy. <laughs> yeah i mean look you got to make that decision for yourself and that's what the minority mindset is it's you got to understand this in your hands and you have to make that first decision that you want to become successful that you want to become wealthy and once you make that decision you got to have a reason for why and that will be your guiding force as to how and why you do it i used to when i was in college my friend gave me an audio cd by a guy named Eric Thomas, motivational speaker. He had an audio CD called The Blueprint to Success. And that audiobook talked about how this guy, Eric Thomas, was homeless in Detroit, eating out of garbage cans, and went to charging $10,000 per speech that he does, motivational <laughs> speech, right? It's like, if, if that guy can do it, E.T., e if he can do it, what is stopping anybody else? What was his differential? What, what made him different? His work ethic, 
So now I was like, oh, well, I got to start working. And now I started learning about what it means to work hard. But then I started learning what it means to work hard versus work smart because working hard is important, but you just need to make sure that your hard work goes in the most scalable and effective way possible. Because a lot of people argue, oh, don't work hard, work smart. No, man, you got to work hard in a smart direction. That way you can get the most benefit out of your hard work. I, you know, I work my butt off. I work a lot of hours. I work a lot of days because I love what I do. Yeah. You know? But my hard work isn't what my hard work was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was lifting heavy speakers. I was sweating my butt off working at weddings. I was working at these events where I have to stop fights from happening. I was you know, doing a lot of hard, physically hard work. Now hard work is thinking. We were in Austin not too long ago and me and a, a, our team were sitting in a hot tub talking about business ideas. Yeah. Hard work changes. And you have to be willing to work hard, but you need to know what it means to work smart. That way you can make your hard work the most, most beneficial that it can be. You know, uh, I have a saying right here on, around our office that hard work in the right, in the smart industry will pay you off because there's a lot of my Marine Corps buddies. We're in the Marines. We work hard, but we're not getting yeah. paid. Uh, yeah. Cops and firefighters today are working hard, but they're they're not in an industry that will make them a lot of money. Sadly, a lot of them are getting fired because they're not willing to take the vaccine. They want to stand up for their beliefs. So, you know, are there particular industries that you favor? This list? If I'm if I got limited capital, if I'm if I'm I'm I'm, I'm the uh, majority that's got five hundred bucks or a thousand bucks to start a business, are there industries that you would guide people towards? Like, okay, hey, consider making your money in this business so that can springboard you into other opportunities. Not necessarily. You can make a lot of money in a lot of industries. And you can see this across history. Gary Dahl made millions of dollars selling a pet rock. He took a rock, drew a smiley face on it, sold it. He was a good marketer and made millions because he told people, why buy a dog where you have to take care of it when you can just buy a rock for your <laughs> son or daughter, right? I mean, so there's a lot of industries if you are a good marketer and if you have that ability. Now, the reality is... You know, some of us have different passions and because of that, you're going to want to do something different, but you have to be educated financially that way you can mess, make the best use of your money. And the thing that makes that so valuable now is because technology has made investing so much more accessible. Like you talked about, oh, what if you want to work as a firefighter or a teacher where you're not getting paid? Well, you have the ability now, if that's what you want to do, to use your money as a tool to invest in something where you can see more potential growth. That way you can become more financially successful while still doing something that you love. Now, obviously, if you're a teacher, you can teach online, go onto YouTube, and you can make more money. I mean, if you can do something scalable, you'll be able to make significantly more money because now you're not capped by what you can do physically in one location. Sure. But you, know, you can invest into startups. There are, there's a whole new world of startup investing thanks to something called Reg CF, Regulation Crowdfunding, which lets regular people, non-accredited investors, invest into startups. And so now you can invest. It is highly risky, very, very, very risky. Yep. You can lose a lot of your money. You can lose all of your money, but there's also the potential for higher rewards. So if you really believe in an industry, like if you are a math teacher, but you love the technology, you love social media, you can invest in social media startups, especially some that you use thanks to this. And then that gives you the opportunity to see that financial upside while doing something that you really care about. It's all just about what are you going to do with the money that you earn? Because it's not just how much money you make that matters. It's what you do with the money that you make. And you have to figure out what is that you like and where you want to now use that money. Did you have examples of that for you growing up in your faith and being a Sikh of people that are entrepreneurs, that there were business people? Because, you know, you kind of mentioned at the beginning of this, that, you know, people of your faith don't borrow, beg for money. Uh, and it, uh, how, how does that work with inside your community there of, of your well, faith? There's two things that I do. One is I like giving, you know, we, we made a video when we hit a million subscribers of uh, us going to a school supply store, buying out a huge chunk of that store and taking the stuff, donating it to a school in Detroit, giving a big donation to the school in Detroit. We gave every single teacher in that school $500 to help them uh, with their purpose we, we gave a big donation to an organization that I was a big supporter of. We walked around the streets of Detroit and asked for financial questions and gave them hundreds of dollars each, $200 to each person, whether you got it right or wrong. We, we try to teach you that way you get it right. That way, once you got it right, you'd get $200. Okay. So, you know, the giving aspect. And then for me, it's more of just 
a, I, I, I have my morals when I invest. And this is something that, you know, it's, it's tough because, you know, I, I don't drink and I don't smoke. So I don't invest in the tobacco industry. I don't invest in the cannabis industry. Could I have made a ton of money because of it? Yeah, I could have made millions, but I chose not to just because I didn't want to. Now, if you believe in that, hey, that's fine. Be my guest, make some money, man. <laughs> you know, that's, that's all you. Just for me, it wasn't right for me. And so when I invest in companies or whatever it is, I invest in things that I personally believe in. You know, I, I am a, an investor in a company called UpCounsel. It is a legal tech company. I'm an attorney and I don't like how attorneys can charge a whole bunch of money to people and small businesses who might not necessarily know what they're getting. And if you want to get top notch legal advice, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And so that's why I invested in UpCounsel because they're trying to revolutionize that where now you can post whatever it is that you want, legal work, especially for small business owner, you post what your job is. And then attorneys who are in that industry will then bid for your job. And what this is doing, it's cutting out the middleman. Because if you work for a big law firm, you might bill $500 an hour, but now some of the money is going to go to your partner. partner. Yep. The senior partner, then it's going to go to the person above you. Then it's going to go to the person who got you this client. So you're just left with a little bit of money. And the reason why they have to charge you so many dollars per hour is because they need to feed everybody. Everybody. every year. And so now we're trying to change that here at UpCounsel because now we're, we're, you're working directly with the attorney. You can cut out all the fat and the attorney is happy because now they get to make more money, even though they're charging less. Yeah. And you're happy. You get the good attorney and you're working yeah. directly with them. So you get to pay less money and you have people bidding for your work. So you can see who's a good attorney. So the legal industry is not being disrupted thanks to the minority mindset. So we're trying to, <laughs> right? So that's exactly what we're trying to do, right? Yeah. I, I invest in industries that I believe in and that, that I want to, you know, an entrepreneur's job is to solve a problem. Your problems are not my problems. My problems are not whoever's watching this problems. Somebody's going to care about the environment. Somebody's going to care about world hunger. Somebody's going to care about education. Somebody's going to care about cancer. Somebody's going to care about AIDS. Yep. That's what makes this world so beautiful is you, you can have your own passion and do something yep. to help whatever it is that you're passionate about. I care about financial education and, and that's what we're spreading every single day. So you, you, you built a lot of your revenue. You became a media company thanks to this wonderful invention called YouTube. So if somebody's starting their business, they're starting their YouTube channel, they're starting their social media, if you were to guide them and advise them how to properly do it, following their passion, to explain their five steps, or how to this, and you know, creating listicles to, to, to explain their passion and how to help and serve other people in their niche, uh, how would you guide them and advise them in starting that, that channel so therefore they get the most amount of revenue from YouTube? So the first thing is, you know, when the majority of people talk about how to make money in YouTube or build a YouTube channel, they give the worst advice ever. <laughs> they, they say, work on your, your tags, your description, your title, your thumbnail. All these things yeah. can optimize a good channel, but they cannot turn a bad channel into a good channel. So what I say is if you want to become successful in the content business, you got to work on three things. CMS, content, monetization, and scaling. We don't work trying to find the best SEO or tags or this and that. What I try to do is I focus on the content. I focus on providing value through my content and just being genuine with what I do. You might not like what I say. You might not like the way I say it, but it's what I believe. Everything that I say is from my heart. Everything I say is very, I, I say with passion. Everything I say, I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, it's from here because I have been there. Everything that I talk about are things that I wish that I knew when I was getting started. And that's what makes YouTube great is if you don't like me, you can watch somebody else. But I focus on the content. And that is what has allowed our channel to grow is because content is king. Content comes first before anything else. So I focus on just what do I know? What can I talk about? And how can I provide the most value to our viewers? Focus on the content. And the reason why that our channel blew up is because I had, that's what I focus on. We spent, you know, I, I was making videos for a long time. And suddenly one day, a video started going viral and this was a year and some change after that video went published. So a year and some change after the video went published, I was still posting videos consistently every single week. And then that video went viral suddenly more than a year after it went live. Wow. Why? Because YouTube saw that we were consistent with our content and that people liked our content. And so we went from getting, you know, a hundred views now to, we went from a small channel to over a hundred thousand subscribers in two months. And it is all because of focus on the content. Second, 
is knowing how to monetize. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can monetize on YouTube, right? You can do affiliates, you can market people uh, through rev shares, you can do sponsorships, you can sell your own product, you can invest in other companies. I tell a lot of YouTubers nowadays, you know, one, you need to charge our sponsors more money. And second, uh, you, you can start to work with these sponsors on a deeper level. You don't, if you don't need the cash, hey, tell them that you want to be an investor in the company. Tell them to pay you with equity. That way now you are invested in the company. You can help them grow. They can help you grow. And you can be a real investor. And people will see that, hey, not only are you talking about something that you believe, but you were invested in it. And then knowing how to scale. Turning your YouTube channel into something that's bigger than just the YouTube channel. Because if YouTube turns off, if the algorithm changes, if whatever yeah. happens, you don't want to be reliant on that. So knowing how do you now turn this into a real business that way it doesn't just rely on you. We publish a newsletter every single day. I don't write any of these newsletters. We have an amazing newsletter team. We publish content every day on our website. I don't write that content. We have a team of great writers who are very knowledgeable about what they do. You know, we have a stock market academy where we have coaches teach people how to invest their money in the stock market. And these are real coaches who are not gurus. These are people who are real life coaches who have been investing for years, getting good returns, who have real money, minimum hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in the market that you can learn from, right? And so these, it's, it's being able to build beyond you. And that's what you have to understand now that if you want to really, do you want to just be a content creator, take the YouTube money and go and spend it? Fine. It's a free country. You can do that. Or do you want to reinvest this money back into your business and build a real business out of your YouTube channel? And nowadays, you know, it's, it's not just YouTube. I mean, there's, there's, if you're just starting off, take advantage of TikTok. TikTok, I mean, especially like if you understand how TikTok works, you can go viral very fast. And sure, maybe the, the sustainability of TikTok isn't the same as YouTube. And, you know, the way that you can monetize on TikTok isn't the same, but what you can do is build exposure very quickly through TikTok, which you can then leverage to help build your brand, whether it's YouTube or whatever it is. So just, it's just, it's a matter of marketing and being able to understand where your core focus is for us. YouTube is our core focus. Um, and TikTok is just there. I, I don't really spend much time on TikTok, but if you're just starting off and you're struggling to grow on YouTube, Use TikTok, use, use Instagram Reels, use these new technologies, which these platforms are pushing to share because they're spending a lot of money trying to get more exposure in that space. So they're willing to push you. Would you say that some of the financial gurus, the personal financial gurus that's currently right now on Fox, uh, that's on MSNBC, the Susie Ormans of the world, the Dave Ramsey's of the world, because I got a lot of people talking to them like they're gospel, yeah. like, like, oh, I, Dave Ramsey said this, or Susie Orman said this, well, and you look at it, it's flawed, it's, it's off. What, what, are your, what, are your, uh, uh, what would your guidance and advice be if people are, are watching in our space of personal finance, when to listen to any guru, what are, your, what are your thoughts that you would give to somebody else on, on making sure that they're finding, finding financial help in, in a way that really serves them versus serving the network that they work for? Learn from everybody and apply what's right for you. For some reason, for some people, Dave Ramsey is the right way to go. For some people, not having a credit card and not going into debt is going to be the right thing. For some people, it's going to be the Robert Kiyosaki medal where you're going into deep, deep, deep debt to leverage things up to the max. You got to figure out what's right for you. What I like to do, what I tell people is learn. Learn from both sides. One of the reasons why we have so much ignorance in this country is because people assume that there's only one right answer. There's only one way to do everything. So they assume, oh, these are my beliefs. Everybody else is wrong. Everybody else is stupid. And that's fueled by social media because as soon as you start liking one thing, they keep showing you more and more and more of that one thing. You go into a rabbit hole and anything that's not within your circle of beliefs is wrong and stupid. What you need to do, the true side of intellect, which will lead to your success, is knowing how to learn learning from both sides. So learn from Dave Ramsey, learn from Susie Orman, learn from Robert Kiyosaki, learn from whoever, learn from everybody and see what's right for you. Try it. You, you, there's no other way around it. I mean, this goes to everything, even in politics. I tell people, you know, I, guess what? I just read Barack Obama's book and I also read Donald Trump's book. I want to learn from both people. I want to learn from both sides. It will help you make a better decision with everything that you want to do because you need to be educated, know the risks. You don't have to agree with everything, but you got to learn. Yeah. And what's right for me might not be right for you. What's right for you might not be right for me. And that's what I always try to teach is I try to teach the education 
that way you can know the different strategies and that way you can pick what's right for you because what's right for me is not you your family came here from from india yeah you're you're are you, are you first generation here you, you my parents were uh for born in punjab i was born in america Okay, so you and I, by the way, I'm wearing Filipino American uh, shirt today. Uh -huh, awesome. So Filipino roots, but made in, but uh, groomed in America. Um, it's Filipino American History Month, by the way, if you didn't know that. But uh, awesome. I, I, I'm I'm curious too in 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 your regards to where America is today, and the madness that you see on social media, the things that people are arguing about, capitalism, socialism. You know what what's what's your two cents on that? Look. There's a reason why people are willing to risk their lives to come to this country. There's a reason why people would be willing to leave their families, their homes, their culture, everything to come to this country. It's a land of opportunity. It's the only place in the world where you see that, where people would be willing to do anything to come here because they have a shot where they know that if they work hard, they have the opportunity to become successful. This is the power that the United States have. And you have a lot of people here that have never seen anything else. They live in a bubble. They haven't seen what life is like outside where some people have to wake up and they're worried about a bomb dropping over their head. You have so much opportunity here. You have every opportunity at your fingertips. You know, my grandparents were refugees. They lost everything when our home state of Punjab was severed. The government lied to them. They promised them one thing and a separate happened where they lost their homes. And when that partition happened, if you were a Sikh, our religion, and you were on the west side of Punjab, you had to migrate east or you were going to be killed. And so my grandparents were on the west side and they were sick, the religion. So then they had to migrate east. So they lost everything, they lost family members, they lost their friends, they lost all their money, they lost their land. They literally had to pick up all my grandfather had was a sword in his hand and the clothes on his back. So now he starts traveling east. They got attacked by a mob on the way. He saw his uncle get his head cut open right in front wow. of him. Wow. Tied up his uncle on a horse. That was the last time he saw him. He came to the new side of India. Didn't have a place to sleep, slept on the ground. He didn't even have shoes on his feet because he lost his shoes along the way. And so what I say is, you know, if he had the opportunity, if he took a day off, he would have been killed, right? He didn't have the luxury of taking days off. Now he had to work and he busted his butt. He went through a lot and was able to build a family. Then in the eighties, my, my parents are, are in India. My, my dad was in India and their family was there in Punjab. And now our, our homestay was getting bombed by our own government. And so now you're in the hot heat. You're sleeping on the roof of your home while the sky is red from shells, from bombs. And you don't sleep in home because if the people see you there, there's a chance you could be killed. So that's when my dad was like, you know, we're getting out of here. And is it hard? Yeah, it's hard here. But guess what? You don't got to worry about a bomb dropping over your head every single morning. And you have freedoms. In other countries, man, if you're in India and you have a certain last name, if you're a certain caste, you could be an untouchable. And wow. people say, oh, that doesn't exist anymore. Okay, go to some of the poorer areas. If you're an untouchable, people will not walk in the same street as you, let alone do business with you. You do not have even the possibility to succeed, let alone achieve any sort of success. Versus here, man, you know, yeah, it's hard for some people, man. But guess what? If you're willing to work, if you're willing to do something different, if you're willing to put in the effort, you can achieve success. Racism exists, yes. Is it harder for some people than others? Yes. Is it impossible? No. And that's, you know, you, you have the opportunity at your fingertips, you just gotta decide what you wanna do with it. That's profound, man, that's profound. Um, last couple of questions around our common friend, a common mentor. Uh, your life was changed. I mean, one of your videos talk about the top top books that changed your life. Number one on my list was Rich Dad Poor Dad, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, we had a pleasure meeting him this uh, this past weekend for the very first time. And and uh, he's also a Marine, he's a Japanese American. I was, you know, uh, I related with him. Not only was he uh, Asian, not only was he a Marine. But, uh, you know, he got his butt kicked in business and uh, made something got scammed, uh, just like uh, you and I have been talking about. Uh, what was your experience in, in meeting together? Because, you know, in, you know, like in sports, like I watched this guy, man, grew up. I was inspired to get in a game of basketball and game of football. And next thing you know, I turned pro in the game. I get to compete with my, 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 my hero growing up. But we have the same parallel experience now in business where some of the gurus that we read their books uh, come up in business. We get to associate and hang out with them. You're getting to hang out with Robert Kiyosaki. What was that experience like for you? 
you know, it's cool getting to meet people that really change your life and you get to learn from them on a very deeper level, which is very interesting. You know, you don't have to agree with everything that they say, but again, it's, you can learn from a lot of things and, and just, just, you get to see where they come from, you know, and, and that's one of the, the crazy things is as you start to really build your journey, you can learn from a lot of people. And I was actually doing an interview re very recently with a uh, ally bank wants to help teach their investors how the internet is changing the shape of, of uh, investing. So, right. This is for, you know, the, because they don't understand big banks don't understand. So I'm talking to them and they're like, you know, how, how is this helping? I was like, look, the average person cannot pick up the phone and talk to someone like Robert Kiyosaki or Kevin O'Leary, right? But we have the ability to do that. And mm -hmm. what we can also do is we have a, a direct connection with our audience. So, you know, we can ask our audience, hey, what questions do you have for Kevin O'Leary? And that's exactly what we did. And so I sat down with him and I asked him the questions from our audience. And so it, it's, the world is changing and, you know, people are becoming more transparent and you're going to realize there's some people that you thought you loved, that you hated. There's people that you thought you hated, that you loved. But at the end of the day, everybody is fighting for something very similar and you have to learn what it is that can benefit you. And there's something that you can learn from everybody. As you wrap up, uh, Jesper, which I really appreciate your time. I know you got to jump on and do another interview because you're just jamming brother. Um, <laughs> Uh, any, any final thoughts on out there in terms of somebody watching this right now? We're a first generation. They're going to be a first generation uh, 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 millionaire aspirations. They're faith based, just as you are. Uh, any guidance and advice for them as we wrap up this interview today? Anything is possible. You just have to think big enough. And, you know, when I was getting started on YouTube, I never thought that we would have a million subscribers or 100,000 subscribers, let alone which is crazy because I always talk about the importance of thinking big. Yeah, here I was thinking small about this just because, why? Because I never thought it was possible. I never thought that somebody would want to watch me. And so you need to think big because your mindset is going to dictate your actions. And if you tell yourself that this is all that you can do, you're not going to think bigger and you're going to continue to think small. So you have to think big and tell yourself that it's possible. And when you have a purpose and a reason for why, you will find a way. You will figure it out. It's not easy. It's not going to happen overnight, but it is possible if you're willing to put in that work. That's really it, man. Awesome. That being said, guys, uh, make sure you follow Jess Breed on Minority Mindset on his YouTube channel, Instagram, and TikTok, and Twitter. He is everywhere. That being said, Jesper, I appreciate you. For those of you watching this right now, put your comments, uh, drop your thoughts, your comments in, uh, in the comment section below. i really love to know what your questions are, any things that you might have as follow-ups for Jesper too as well. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our Facebook page, Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and notifications. Be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. On behalf of Jesper, saying of Minority Mindset, I'm a Money Smart Guy, and until we meet again, continue Thank listening. Thank you, man. Continue love smart and be money smart today. Bless you guys. Bye-bye. Appreciate it, man.